today I'm going to be talking about a project that we've been working on for several years as part of the Committee on Earth Observation Satellites. Uh, first, the Volcano Pilot Project, and now the Volcano Demonstrator Project. And as I'll talk in this talk today, um, going forward to try to um, think about ways of utilizing the sort of exponentially growing number of satellites uh, that are in orbit for better use at volcanoes. Um, and this is really uh, built on uh, presentations that I gave at the EarthScope meeting earlier this year um, with some updates as well as some highlights from a talk I gave at the IFC meeting. Um, so you'll see some similarity if you saw both of those talks before, but hopefully most of you will see something new today. All right, so I'm just starting with um, some eye candy uh, as one example of some of the new types of data we're getting in. So this is from a commercial mission called Umbra, uh, very high spatial resolution imagery, um, in this case of Mount Fuji volcano. And this is the sort of data that we're talking about, uh, among many other types um, that we would like to be able to better exploit for volcano uh, science and hazards. So let me just give you the punchline up front uh, in case you check out or uh, need to leave. Um, and that is, we now know after multiple decades of having satellite data for volcano observatories, which are the agencies around the world that are res governmentally responsible for tracking activity at volcanoes, that satellite data are useful for them. They're complementary to ground-based data, um, but these data are still not being fully exploited. Um, Using data from a variety of different sensors around the world and a variety of different volcanoes does aid in understanding at any individual volcano. Um, as I'll talk about later, we have uh, a biased understanding of the relationship between volcanic unrest and eruption because we've only been able to study in detail a few, a handful of systems. And volcanic systems are often unique or have unusual behaviors that don't necessarily manifest themselves at every other volcano that's well studied. And so we do gain something uh, from monitoring all the volcanoes that can be applied to any individual volcano. The other key point that we were, I'm gonna to try to convince you of today is that something that we often use satellite data for is hindcasting, understanding what happened during a past eruption. And I'll make the claim that we can use these data also for forecasting, which um, as I'll show you has been demonstrated in a few examples, but oftentimes there are barriers that are not allowing that satellite data to be useful in that forecasting role. And so I think my, my key takeaway message today is that we have resources in orbit that we are not fully exploiting yet, and it's going to take a, a community effort to better exploit them uh, for thinking about for forecasting volcanic activity. All right, so um, let me let me go, go to this slide. So I'll ask, I guess nobody can answer these questions, <laughs> uh, but uh, think about this question. What fraction of volcanoes do you think are continuously monitored from the ground? All right, and the answer is B. Approximately. Uh, this is a debatable question. Maybe we can have a debate in the um, chat, but how do, we, how do we estimate this question of how are volcanoes monitored on the ground as sort of a starting point? And we can look at this in a variety of different ways. So there have been several recent compilations. One compilation here by Whitehead and Bebington looked at compilations of which volcanoes had seismometers. And um, they sort of found that, you know, approximately of these, this particular subset of volcanoes, uh, which is volcanoes that have had an eruption in the Holocene, uh, there were about 50%. Um, another study that was done um, uh, sort of out of the Earth Observatory of Singapore was using this, this online tool that they have called uh, the GVMID or the uh, Global Volcano Monitoring Infrastructure Database. You can log on to this, this tool and see uh, uh, based on data that's been provided to them where are there different types of sensors at volcanoes and uh, they looked at particularly looking at for example ground deformation sensors of various kinds could be gnss could be tilt meters about 40 percent of um, the volcanoes that are considered potentially active have the sort of a sensor uh, Diana Roman um, of the Carnegie Institute for Science um, also did a different type of survey looking not just at um, volcanoes that had one seismometer, but where were their good networks? And so this is where she came up with a number, just looking at data that was available through the uh, FDSN, um, you know, of the volcanoes that have erupted over the last 40 years, maybe about 30% are unmonitored, are well monitored. And so that's where I get the 30% data, uh, percent 
number. Again, it's it, it depends on what you put in the numerator and the denominator, and that varies in each one of these different types of studies. Um, but that seems to be a generally representative uh, assessment based on, for example, this particular study here on the Global Volcanic and Risk book uh, that was published a few years ago that estimated that about 35% of volcanoes that have erupted um, since the year 1500 are continuously monitored in some way. All right, so we have only a fraction of the world's volcanoes are monitored continuously uh, from the ground. And so this really allows us to think about what other things we could do. And so in addition to just what is the numerical number of those volcanoes, of the volcanoes that are well monitored or well reported in studies, here is a, a survey that was taken um, by in Nature Geosciences at an editorial that was just looking at sort of a the volcanoes that we have a lot of papers or a lot of studies about or even a lot of data about are not globally representative of all volcanoes and so this is just one plot of looking at that sort of statistic. Um, looking at the number of papers that have been published over a 20 year time period of volcanoes and how are they distributed among those different volcanoes. So. Since we have this problem that not all volcanoes around the world are monitored with continuous ground instruments. To what extent can satellites fill in the gaps? And the answer is it's growing capabilities. So that we have, for example, an example here from a recent eruption, Epitone de la Fornace. Uh, this is just based on some things that uh, were posted uh, to what was then called Twitter, um, just from Rafael Grendon of uh, IPGP, sort of on from a single eruption, what different products could we use? And so I sort of categorize these in a couple of different categories of what we can do from space. We can monitor changes to the surface and topography, and we can do that using optical and SAR sensors. Here's just an example of a high resolution, spatial resolution SAR sensor showing, you know, the formation of lava flows, the formation of new domes. Other things you can do is you can measure gas emissions. Um, there are new sensors in this case uh, from a sensor called Tropomi, which can measure um, sulfur dioxide and this is showing measurements of sulfur dioxide from this particular eruption. We can also measure thermal data, and there's a variety of tools for measuring thermal data at different spatial resolutions and different temporal resolutions. Um, but this is an example from the Sentinel-2 sensor that's showing you know, the lava flows that are coming out from this uh, particular eruption. Um, here's showing an example of an interferogram showing ground deformation associated with this eruption. Um, and I won't talk much about ash, but ash is also another variable that can be measured from space. So um, I'm not going to review all of these different types of techniques uh, today, but just know that there is uh, a review paper that we have recently published uh, through the USGS on um, the from the USGS Powell Center that sort of reviews all these different types of techniques. And we have some videos from workshops that try to train people how to use these different techniques. So there's a lot of different ways of using different types of satellite data, but I'm going to focus today primarily on surface and topogra topographic change and uh, ground deformation. All right, so here's another question for you to think about. Of the volcanoes around the world, how many of these volcanoes are monitored from space? I mentioned about 30% monitored continuously from the ground. How many can we get from space? And uh, so think about is it 30%, is it 50%, 100%? Or, you know, you might see this final answer and get a little suspicious. Well, if there's an answer that says it depends, that might be the right answer. You are correct. And it does depend on the sensor. So not every satellite is collecting data over every volcano. Um, some, some satellites do, and a lot of satellites do not. And that's really another key thrust of my talk today is um, there are set resources in orbit that we are not maximizing their ability to, to help us with volcanoes. So here's just an example of comparing this. So some satellites are providing so much data that it's hard to deal with the fire hose of data that we're already getting for volcanoes. And so this includes things like um, currently operational meteorological satellites. Um, these are geostationary satellites that can provide observations of any particular volcano on the order of every uh, few minutes. Um, and these data are just coming down in such a flood of data that they cannot be analyzed by individuals and they have automatic routines that are being used by NOAA, uh, Mike Pavilonis and others to, to try to estimate, you know, where do we see volcanic hotspots, where do we see ash clouds in real time. Um, the forthcoming NASA and um, Indian Space Research Organization's NISAR satellite will also fall in this category, where it will basically produce petabytes of data per year and provide um, 
more data than all previous uh, NASA missions combined. And so dealing with these floods of data is going to be a major concern in its own right that I'm not going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about other problems. And those problems are particularly satellites that aren't collecting data over volcanoes or satellites where the data is being collected over volcanoes, but that don't have an open data policy. And so therefore, those data are not being used by volcano observatories and the people who need to use that data. All right, so just to give you a sense, I mentioned that not all volcanoes have been studied with satellite data. How many volcanoes out there are, um, have had some sort of satellite detections? Is it the, all of the erupting volcanoes that have, that have erupted since the year 1978? Is it all Holocene aged volcanoes? Or you might guess by the way I'm describing this, it's somewhere in between. So over 400 different volcanoes have had some sort of activity, whether it be an eruption, a pre-eruption or some other type of activity measured from satellites um, on the ground. And so this is giving you some, uh, again, sort of summarized in the USGS Powell report, giving you a sense of here's where the uh, you know, gas observations are at about 180 volcanoes, deformation over 200. Um, thermal data is uh, where what we get most detections of volcanoes uh, activity from, and giving you some sense that among this, this comes out to be about uh, 411 uh, unique volcanoes, just to give you a sense of how useful volcanoes could be for global monitoring um, currently. And again, this inventory, uh, lots of caveats, we sort of used uh, exist, you know, data that has been around for decades, um, compiled together what we could, but it is not necessarily the most complete in terms of spatial or temporal resolution. So a lot of the things that we mix, for example, the, the tropomy sensor I mentioned uh, before, new thermal resources and new newly available INSAR data. All right, so just to give you a sense of what we know already, where are most of these uh, volcanoes that we're detecting activity from? So here's a bunch of countries that have a lot of activity at different volcanoes. And the country on this list that has the most satellite detections is Indonesia. And so this is not a huge surprise. You know, if you look at the Smithsonian's database of how many different um, uh, volcanoes are in each country, you'll see that uh, Indonesia may not be the first in terms of the total number of volcanoes in that country, but it does have a lot more eruptions than many other countries. And so this is giving you a sense that um, I think a very interesting uh, observation that, you know, we look at the number of volcanoes, the number of detections we have from satellites, and you can see that the percentage of volcanoes with detected activity varies a lot from country to country. Um, some places north of 50% of the volcanoes that are considered potentially active by the Smithsonian are having some sort of satellite detections, while other countries have much fewer. And I think a question that's still an active area of research is, does this variation in the percentage tell us something inherent about the nature of volcanism in those countries? Or is this really a reflection of our ability uh, from the satellites to be able to detect that activity? Uh, do we have a detection bias? So that's an active area of research. But uh, one thing that we can do is by using satellites and using the same sensor to detect activity in a variety of these different areas, we can find that there's a lot of variation uh, just in the type of activity we can detect from satellites in these different areas. So here's just a comparison of three different areas. So this is comparing Africa and some nearby islands, uh, Southeast Asia and Latin America. And what we're seeing in these different areas is for example, on the denominator, seeing how many um, potentially active volcanoes are in that area, and this is the number of, of uh, volcanoes with some sort of activity detected by satellites. And you can see that there's a huge difference. As I mentioned, thermal is a very common um, way of detecting satellite activity, but at African volcanoes, deformation is the most commonly uh, way of detecting volcanic uh, activity. And so you can start to think through, again, we're still working through the, the essence of to what extent are these Venn diagrams um, completely representative of activity and to what extent are there still some observational biases within there, but you can start to see that there may be some differences between different areas of the world in terms of how active, uh, how volcanoes manifest their activity. Is it thermal, is it deformation, is it degassing, um, and how that activity can be detected by satellites. So here's another way of looking at this data uh, presented uh, by Susie Ebmeyer, which is looking at 
um, the number of volcanoes in different parts of the world and the number of satellite observations. And you can sort of see that in general, there's a correlation between these, these variables, um, but there is some often variation within regions between how many thermal detections versus how many gas or deformation detections. And so, for example, in Indonesia, you can see there's a huge discrepancy here, or there's a few other areas as well. And those are, again, areas where we'd like to really focus further study to understand, do we see a dearth of deformation in some of these areas because um, our ability to measure deformation from space has been incomplete with the existing satellite sensors. All right. So let me now shift to this question of thinking about forecasting. I'm trying to give you a sense of the state of the art in terms of what we can do with our current or, or past capabilities of satellite detections. Um, what do we want to have going forward in terms of uh, techniques that are most useful for helping us to identify how do we know what volcanoes are going to erupt next? And again, if you see in all of the above, you might be suspicious that yes, um, volcanoes are heterogeneous enough in their behaviors that we think that each of these different types of, of measurements may be useful under certain circumstances. And so here is just an example of the type of thing that we would love to see more of going forward, which is a comparison of measurements at a given volcano, in this case at Copahue volcano on the Chile Argentina border that shows you a time series going over the course of almost 20 years. Uh, showing degassing activity, thermal activity, deformation activity. Up here is sort of from the Smithsonian telling you when uh, there were eruptions that were recorded. And what you can see here is, I think, a nice illustration of multiple lines of evidence from these different sensors pointing to changing activity at Copahue. So here was a volcano that was deform was subsiding over multiple decades, changed its pattern to uplift, also changed its thermal activity, also changed its degassing activity, and all of those things presaged this uh, eruption that happened at a later time. So. Again, finding uh, multiple strands of satellite observations that we could work together with ground-based data um, helps us to be, have more confidence that there's a change in activity that, that may uh, be helpful in forecasting future activity. But for the rest of my talk today, I'm gonna to focus in particular on synthetic aperture radar data. And this is a particular interest because it has been actually used in a uh, study by, as described here by John Pallister at Merapi Volcano in Indonesia to help inform in real time uh, what evacuation orders would be given. And so this is one data set used in a stream of other types of data, particularly seismic data that was used. And in particular, what was useful in this case was high spatial resolution data. And so this was showing you data that was um, acquired over Merapi, showing you the presence of a lava dome. And in particular, what was measured here was a very rapid effusion rate um, that indicated an increased hazard. And so this is sort of showing you from a slightly different uh, data set, uh, what does the uh, crater look like without the dome after the explosion had occurred. So this was a particular uh, use of high spatial resolution data that could be provided to an observatory in near real time to help inform along with other data sets that oh we see a change that change is correlated with an increased effusion rate that we have uh, know that is a potential clue that there's about a large explosion to happen and so this is a case where that was used and evacuation order was issued and lives were saved let me give you another example of a more recent data set that sort of showed um, again, this in this case used in a hind casting mode, but also shows the potential of high spatial resolution and, and high temporal resolution data. So um, this is showing you from the La Zufre, um volcano in St. Vincent in the Caribbean, showing you that that over the course of many months, there was the, the extrusion of a lava dome. And this is uh, so shown here in this case from a Terrasar X satellite, which is uh, run by German Space Agency and Airbus. Um, with very high spatial resolution compared to uh, which is sort of the the, the standard uh, tool that we use for a lot of global INSAR work, which is the Sentinel-1 data, uh, which has an open data policy that is always a standard that we compare things to, just to give you a sense of what the spatial resolution of 20 meters versus um, sort of uh, one meter uh, per pixel, I should say this is Sentinel-1, this is a typo, um, what you can resolve. And this is work that was done by Edna Dula, uh, now at the University of Bristol. 
And in particular, what she was able to do was she was able to use those SAR imagery that was used in this sort of little time series here. And she was able to uh, map, in this case, the spatial extent and use some things like radar shadows to try to estimate what was the volume. What was the volume being extruded over those time periods uh, that in, before the explosion that led to that um, large crater being formed that you saw in that time series? And what you could see here is that the rate of extrusion was relatively linear until we sort of zoom in here on the days before that explosive eruption occurred, where you can see here is a couple of data that just uh, coincidentally she was able to acquire just in the couple of days before the explosion occurred, where you can see a large change in the effusion rate. So this is uh, an example here where by mapping with this high spatial resolution of a meter or so per pixel with time periods of you know almost daily you could estimate these changes in effusion rate that might be very useful for assessing that there is um, a change in the system that might lead to an, uh, an explosion similar to what we are seeing in the Merapi example together so the the takeaway point from this and the Merapi example is that high spatial resolution SAR data are extremely valuable potentially for these sort of situations where we need to measure uh, changes in the effusion rate. And these are SAR data are particularly useful because as an active radar, you're able to see through clouds and it's and acquire data at night. And so that sort of sort of all weather capability allows you to provide a more robust uh, time series. All right, so that is the the scientific goal is we would love to be able to have more dense spatial and temporal measurements of uh volcanic inside volcanic craters where we may not have any ground-based sensors and the opportunity is that there is a huge increase in the number of SAR satellites and satellites in general in space so here's an example uh, from a report in nature that just shows you um, over the last few years there's been a huge increase in the number of satellites in orbit um, even when you take, you know, a lot of these are related to the Starlink uh, internet uh, communications satellites, but even taking those out, there's all still been a huge increase in the number of satellites, and that also applies to the number of SAR satellites. That this is showing you um, sort of where we have been in the number of SAR satellites for decades, and where we are now is somewhere around 68 SAR satellites, and that number is projected to grow. Um, and this is all related to a hashtag a golden age of SAR. So why is this happening? Well, a lot of this increase in satellites is driven by commercial missions and constellations of satellites that people are finding that there is uh, potentially an economic or business case to be made for acquiring data um, on a daily or even a sub daily basis at high spatial resolution. And this is in part driving this, this huge increase in the number of SAR satellites. Just to give you a sense, not all SAR satellites are created equal. This is trying to give you a sense uh, from a nice paper um, by Pablo Gonzalez, sort of showing you just the diversity of modes that people use uh, synthetic aperture radar in. There is everything from a spotlight mode that covers a sp small footprint on the ground at high spatial resolution to wide swath or scan SAR modes that um, cover a large area, but at a lower spatial resolution. And so this gives you some sense as to um, what sort of systems exist in orbit. And we're gonna particularly focus on these sort of high spatial resolution sensors that I mentioned were so important uh, at the Merapi and at, at, uh, at St. Vincent, sort of on the, on the scale of sort of five meters per pixel or less. And just to give you a sense as to why, what, the, what these satellites look like, this is sort of a, uh, a current, current satellite that's Terrasar X that I showed you some data from before. And this is an example of one of these commercial satellites, in this case from Capella Space, showing you what it looks like at launch, and then it sort of deploys into something that looks uh, like this. And so this is giving you some sense as to, um, you know, some of these satellites may not live for more than a few years, but they are cheap enough, a few million dollars per satellite, that they just are being launched uh, as part of the, these corporate uh, uh, plans of developing a, a continuously operating constellation where Capella Space or ISI or Umbra may have a dozen or more satellites uh, in orbit at a given time. All right, so the I've talked about the challenge being that we would love to have high spatial resolution imagery. Um, we have an opportunity and that there's a large, large amount of, of satellites in orbit, 
bringing those two things together is uh, the reason I'm talking to you today about this topic, which is that there are several challenges involved. One is that, as I mentioned, many of these missions are commercial. So how do we gain access to commercial data? Well, there are several different avenues um, and there are ways of, of acquiring this data that you can look into. I'm glad to help answer questions and there are other ways I can point you to. It's not easy, but it is possible through things like the NASA Commercial Small Sat Data Acquisition Program, um, through to employees of the, the US federal government, um, through the European Space Agency, and also through other um, entities like the Geohazard Supersites and Natural Laboratories. Now, it may not include all of these different types of satellites I'm talking about, but it may include a subset that is useful um, for volcano monitoring in, in some particular area. And so let me say, just talk briefly about the sort of second challenge. So, so challenge number one is, you know, does the, how do we get data, uh, our hands on the data, if the data exists? And I'm gonna to try to talk about the second challenge is, is the data being acquired over volcanoes in the first place? And so that's challenge number two. And so let me just give you a sense of, Challenge number two, uh, I'll just walk you through. This is one particular satellite uh, constellation. In this case, this is Terrasar X, Tandem X, PAWS, three satellites that are uh, interoperable in terms of being able to share data. And this is just showing you an example of, in this case, the number of potentially active volcanoes in these different areas of the world. And this is just looking at where uh, within these regions has there been, you know, data acquired that's you know more than one scene um, and so you can see that in, <laughs> across these areas it's maybe on the order of 30 percent of the volcanoes are getting this type of data and it varies a little bit from region to region in the u.s um, some of these data have been uh, requested more thoroughly by the u.s scientists at the usgs um, than in other areas and so Challenge number two is that not all uh, space agencies are collecting data over volcanoes and particularly what we might call high interest or high risk volcanoes. And so what can we do about this uh, sort of question? And so we have started to, to try to build a community around helping to identify what are the highest priority volcanoes that, um, you know, of the 1400 subaerial volcanoes in the world that are considered potentially active uh, because they've had an eruption over the last 10,000 years, how many of those volcanoes do we um, think are the most active and as defined by maybe having a currently ongoing uh, seismic activity or ground deformation or some other type of activity or have had a recent eruption. And so based on that, we came up with a classification that you can download and provide input on trying to revise. It's available through Open Science Foundation. And we came up with this list of basically saying, okay, of the most active volcanoes, we need to get weekly observations might be on the order of 200 uh, versus you know volcanoes that have not been active in some time, we could maybe have less frequent observations. And so with this targeted list, um, our goal is to try to help identify with the different space agencies where should they turn on their satellites to make sure that we're getting uh, the dense data that we need over the volcanoes that are uh, either erupting or appear to show some signs of unrest. And I guess the other important thing to say is that um, thinking about this through a global coordinated strategy, it might be the case that, oh, well, why aren't satellites being turned on over all these volcanoes? Well, usually the, the problem is there's some limitation in data downloads. So we may not be able to turn on this particular satellite over every volcano, but maybe since we have these multiple constellations of different satellites, maybe, okay, you focus on this satellite with the um, with your constellation and somebody else focuses on a different volcano with their constellation. And through this sort of coordinated approach, we could monitor all 200 of these uh, high priority volcanoes. Just to give you a sense as to what could be possible, this is showing you an example from one of these commercial satellites. In this case, looking at the eruption that happened in uh, southwestern Iceland. Um, this is the volcano that has erupted uh, pretty much every year since 2021. It's now in its third eruption. Um, and this is showing you sort of data from this constellation of commercial satellites called ISI, both sort of how the lava flows have grown over the course of time and in a radar view, and in this case is an optical view, sort of showing you the, um, the value of the radar in terms of seeing through some of the clouds that come uh, from the ash from the eruption. 
And this is showing you what's possible um, from one of these, these uh, commercial satellites when they control the orbits well enough that they can do interferometry. In this case, these are one day interferograms during the course of this eruption, showing uh, the evolution of the eruption and the changing um, role of dike intrusions in different parts of the system. So this is a phenomenal capability. Unfortunately, um, it's very uh, expensive in terms of fuel to be able to control this, the orbits well enough, especially for these very tiny satellites. And so this may not be something that is routinely available, um, but again, something that um, is sort of showing the value of one day long interferograms uh, in terms of monitoring the evolution of an eruption um, that may be possible in the future with uh, this growing constellation of satellites. A third challenge I wanted to mention was, okay, let's say we finally get the data acquired over the volcanoes where we need it. How do we now get that data to the people who need it? And um, there's several different potential uh, obstacles in the way. For, first of all, you know, does the satellite system have the capability of providing that data in near real time? Secondly, does the um, can the data then be used to quickly generate the products that could be used by the end user to help understand how to use that data? Um, and then secondly, is there the expertise to evaluate what is both uh, the data are showing and what sources of noise may be uh, in that data? And so uh, part of the, the international community around thinking about all of these questions has helped to mobilize um, these workshops that we've held over the course of the last uh, five years um, looking at building a community of people who sort of know a lot about the, the remote sensing data from the volcano observatories um, to all talk to each other and, and help to develop tools that can make this uh, build on this particular obstacle in the getting the data, if we do get it all acquired, to be used um, in the most rapid way possible. All right. So, I've tried to outline for you sort of the scientific goals, um, the, the sort of the, the challenges. Um, I, I wanted to leave you with sort of at the end here, sort of a vision of like, where could we be in five or 10 years um, with what would a global volcano satellite observatory look like? And, you know, the analogy that we often point to across different uh, communities is the meteorological community, which is a understood international agreement that we all know that we all benefit around the world by better weather forecasts and better weather forecasts are, are improved by having access to data. And so this is just showing you an example of all the different satellites that are part of this uh, international uh, meteorological um, observation network. And <laughs> our goal would be to build something similar for volcanoes. And again, this is uh, a challenge because I mean, there's a challenge and an opportunity always, of course. So there are already many different tools that are available online where you can go and look at satellite thermal data. And there is sort of routine INSAR processing that is being done by uh, the Comet Group in the United Kingdom. And there are other groups that process routinely sulfur dioxide data and so forth. And so there are many different um, spokes that could be combined together to make a wheel of this uh, sort of global volcano satellite monitoring. And so it's just a question of finding ways to optimize this for um, use by the volcano observatories in their routine observations. And so uh, from the sense of the data I've been talking about today, which is basically synthetic aperture radar data, thinking about um, high resolution uh, spatial observations, as well as interferometry, um, the next step uh, going forward is we hope um, a group of the, the international group called the uh, Committee on Earth Observing Satellites, CEOS, is now proposing uh, what they're calling an International Virtual Volcano Observatory, uh, which will uh, sort of be a follow on to the Volcano Demonstrator product uh, project that I talked to you about a little bit uh, earlier, but now extending this to a global uh, observation mode where we have different regions of the world, we have different quotas from some of these uh, uh, space providers, and we sort of hopefully can build up infrastructure to uh, release that data, to train the users, and um, encourage other uh, space agencies and commercial companies to grow in the, um, the use of that data for volcano monitoring. And <clears throat> since this is an Earthscope web webinar, I at least wanted to put forward the idea that um, 
Earthscope and the Sage Gauge uh, institutions and UNAVCO uh, before them, uh, through a group called WINSAR, has already played an important role in this activity. Um, WINSAR was formed back in the 90s when basically all SAR data was commercially available, and a group of researchers decided that they would try to pool their data together to, to better um, provide access to anybody who wanted to use it. And so I see a continued ability, uh, you know, Earthscope is continuing to provide access to some restricted SAR data sets. Um, that is a, a service that they provide uh, through the geodetic imaging program. Um, and this is something that we could continue to consider to grow in terms of the capabilities of providing a password protected website that allows these commercial data to still be restricted to the sense that they need to be users who are signing data use agreements so they don't use the data for um, purposes that are not allowed by those agreements. Um, Earthscope could continue to facilitate this through the services of distributing data, as well as they have a long track record of providing training um, in a variety of different ways of processing this data, different types of software, and making that open source software available. All right. I guess the final thing I wanted to mention is as we enter an era where we have more and more satellite data, we enter an era where we have the capability of uh, anyone can post an interferogram or a satellite image onto social media and make some pronouncement about what they're seeing. And so this is um, <laughs> this is all exciting that we have access to this data, but um, there's also a shared responsibility by all people who are using this data to avoid misinformation and providing some, in this case, as an example of a signal that was seen that was then uh, noted that the signal was probably related to an atmospheric effect. Um, and so this is, Again, it's something else that needs to be considered as to how do we deal in a world where it's, you know, as we make data easier to get and easier to disseminate through social media, how do we best uh, do this in a responsible way that doesn't lead to sort of conflicts of information, of misinformation, um, and making the job of the volcano observatories harder. And so um, there was an old best practices that was written about this uh, some 20 years ago before social media exists, and that sort of effort uh, needs to, to be updated. All right, so let me just summarize here at the end. Um, hopefully I've convinced you that high spatial resolution so the synthetic aperture radar data improves our ability to make eruption poor forecasts, but is underutilized both because um, the data might be restricted, but more to the problem, the data may not be acquired over the volcanoes where it is most needed. Um, you know, formation of something like the International Virtual Volcano Observatory will help in a part, uh, but there are still huge gaps in terms of data that may exist or data that could exist that we are not fully exploiting yet. So there's still a lot of work to do um, as a community to try to make sure that uh, we're collecting the data over the volcanoes that really need it. And in particular, um, there's always going to be work to be done to uh, make sure that this uh, data is provided in a in a way that is um, timely and in formats that could be used by the volcano observatories um, and to, to train them and to help build networks amongst them to, to deal with this these new data sets that are uh, so promising for helping us to understand volcanic hazards. All right, so uh, with that, let me stop and take any questions that you have. Thanks for your attention. Excellent, thank you so much, Matt. That was a really fascinating talk. I very much appreciate you uh, going through that with us. I have just sent a message out to the chat. So if any of you that are tuning in for this uh, live have a question for, for our speaker, please go ahead and use the Q&A box to, to send those questions in. In the meantime, I did have a few um, questions here that I wanted to start off with. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about the um, availability of data over the volcanoes of interest. And I'm curious to know, is, is there a latitude bias for the satellite observations? I mean, you have more satellites passing over the equator versus the poles. Is there a kind of a breakdown for that in terms of um, for, for SAR uh, observations on, on uh, the types of satellites that you'd be interested in? Great, great question. Um, so most of the satellites we're dealing with are polar orbiting satellites. So they actually have orbits that converge near the poles. So they usually have better um, observations sort of overlapping tracks near the poles. So the poles are often uh, better sampled than the equator. Um, I will say that there are some commercial sensors that actually, Capella Space is an example, 
where they also have some orbits that are more highly inclined. So there actually is some, at the moment, they can't sort of get any observations that are sort of north or south of about 52 degrees. And so that does, you know, depending on what they, uh, but that's sort of a very much a minority. I, I would say the majority of, of our satellites are getting more frequent observations near the poles than near the equator. Okay. Are there any upcoming or planned satellite launches that you're aware of that look like they, you know, significantly improve our ability to to monitor volcanoes? Yeah. So the I mentioned briefly the the NISAR mission, which is the one that I'm personally most excited about. It's why is it exciting? Well, first of all, it's going to have an open data policy. It's going to be launched probably in early 2024. Um, and it's going to be what we call wall-to-wall -wall coverage. So their mission is um, going to collect data over all land surfaces. They're going to change the mode, the spatial resolutions, and, and polarizations, and things like that a little bit. But they are going to acquire, you know, data everywhere. Not quite all the time because their repeat time is uh, there's just one satellite. Um, but they are going to be again. This is why they're going to be providing sort of petabytes of data per year and and sort of overwhelming. Uh, you know, all previous NASA missions combined, um, just because of this wall to wall coverage. And so that's going to be a great data set. Um, it's going to be at a wavelength that sort of penetrates through a lot of vegetation cover. So we'll really have a good sense, uh, particularly in tropical areas. Um, but it's going to have a, it's not going to sort of solve all of our problems. So continued use of these sort of constellations of satellites where we could get measurements more frequently, maybe at higher, at, definitely at higher spatial resolutions, um, sort of mean that, um, you know, there is, it, it's sort of like a, you know, it's going to be a game changer in terms of uh, looking at certain volcanoes we couldn't look at before, but, you know, it's it's not the whole picture. And so really, we still emphasize wanting to use all these different satellites. I'm glad you talked about the quantity of data that would be coming in from, from NISAR and uh, that sort of motivates the, the next question I had on my list here. Um, you know, uh, you anticipated this with one of the slides in your talk, talking about some of the methods that people are are working on to to ingest all this data that's coming in, and I'm I'm curious to know, like, um, I, I don't know, are there are there is there more you can say about how far along that effort is? I mean, if NISAR were to turn on, you know, next week, would be would we be ready to process those data? And um, in particular, I guess I'm curious thinking about some of the some of the recent efforts in with machine learning and um, AI to, to speed up and improve processing are are those being considered for some of these um, some of these processes that would work on the the flood of data that um, that'd be coming in? Yes, that's a great question, and I think um, you know I, I think this particular mission is really getting people to think more about doing things in the cloud. That you know we're moving, we're, you know, with this volume that we're moving to the stage where. You're not going to be downloading every SAR image onto your own desktop and processing it like we have done uh, for many decades now. And so um, that is motivating, you know, there are several different sort of cloud architectures that are still being sort of talked about. You know, uh, I think the, the data center that's going to be provided for NISAR is from the Alaska satellite facility up at Fairbanks. Um, and so they are working a lot on um, some of these questions. Um, to your question about AI and machine learning, that is that is a great question. And, and you know, just like with all areas of geophysics, that's an area of huge growth. You know, there are, you know, more and more papers all the time about how do we automatically go through um, stacks of these data or time series of these data to try to find anomalies. Um, so there's a great set of products already being provided um, by this Comet consortium that I mentioned in the UK that they're using this for the Sentinel One data. And so they have sort of got, gotten something operational. Um, they are still, you know, sort of fine tuning all the things, but, you know, what they found so far is very impressive in terms of being able to detect um, sort of subtle changes in, in activity. But, you know, again, they can't detect everything. There are certain volcanoes that their, their um, satellites are not optimal for vegetated volcanoes, uh, volcanoes with ice on them, you know, looking for very small spatial resolution signals. So. You know, there's still going to always be a role for people who are going to come in and do detailed studies at, at uh, a few volcanoes, in addition to doing sort of these global um, sort of near real time anomaly detectors. Thinking about the um, new satellites coming online, you touched on the fact that 
the number of SAR satellites is has significantly increased, and it's expected to to go up much more rapidly in going into the future. You know, I think a lot of us hear uh, in the news and whatnot about these uh, satellite constellations for internet connectivity, things like uh, Starlink and 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 that sort of uh, um, that sort of setup. I'm just wondering, how does the explosion of these you know commercial satellite constellations D does that have much of an impact on the availability of useful data for volcano monitoring, or is that really kind of a separate thing? And the types of satellites that you would need to get useful data for volcano monitoring that are sort of in a different class. Mm. Yeah, so I, I guess my point is that there are some of these, you know, so as I mentioned, you know, there are now thousands more satellites than there were a few years ago. And, you know, of those, you know, it is a small percentage, but it's still you know, something close to 70 at the moment of, of SAR satellites that are in orbit. Um, and, and all of those could be useful for volcanoes. Um, and so I would just say that, um, you know, and again, the, the problem is that some of those are still experimental. Some of them, uh, you know, can only acquire data for a small fraction of their orbits. And so they're very limited in terms of what they can do. Um, but their capabilities are just going to keep growing with time. And so I think it, now is the time to say, hey, Volcanoes are an important tool. We already know where the volcanoes are. So if you could turn on your satellites over these particular volcanoes, and you know, we can we can sort of negotiate, you know, between the different sort of agencies about, okay, you want to focus on these volcanoes. Well, you can this other mission will focus on those volcanoes, but at least getting some sort of data. And in particular, I think one of our goals going forward is um, daily data during eruptions. So really saying, okay, what if, you know, for particular eruptions, let's turn everything on. And so we have a couple of examples now where of papers published in the last few years where they've done that. Like uh, there's some papers published at Niragongo Volcano in the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo, where there's a beautiful table in the supplemental that's just like, <clears throat> you know, they list all the different types of satellites they're using and they're getting like sub daily observations from all of these together to sort of look at the level of the, of the lava lake with inside the crater and things like this. And so the capabilities exist. And <clears throat> the problem is that it's only happening for a very small fraction of, of volcanoes currently. And so that's what we're trying to, to, to grow the perspective that, um, you know, there's many other volcanoes that we could we could target um, that would be extremely useful from a from a science and a hazards perspective. We did have a question come in about um, in in reference to to AI and this um, the question is wondering if uh, if you see AI eventually replacing SAR scientists for the interpretation of satellite data. You know, I think. Uh, you know, from what I can see, you know, AI is still not able to replace. <laughs> it's sort of an augmenting tool, like in a lot of different areas. It's sort of like this is a tool that can help take away routine tasks or help us, you know, if we're getting thousands or tens of thousands of images, which are the ones that seem anomalous that we should have a, you know, more experienced person look at in greater detail. And that's, I think there's still going to be the role for that. Again, maybe I can't predict where we'll be in five or 10 years with AI. Uh, but at least for every system that I've seen today, there, there still needs to be someone looking over the shoulder to say, oh, you know, that's really an atmospheric effect or, you know, you missed something. Because a lot of these systems, I think the other problem is that, you know, they're trained on a certain set of data. And, you know, is that data really representative of what the real Earth can throw at us or is it incomplete? And, um, uh, and so I guess I'm still optimistic that there will need to be star scientists. 